Go ahead and have a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 is our text, and if you're in the room or at a Parker campus and you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. If you're in our room, uh, just grab a Bible in the seats around you here at Sweetwater. If you're at our Parker campus, then there's a table right back in the middle of the room. Get up right now, go grab one of those Bibles, and turn to page 1033. Page 1033, you'll be able to follow along uh, Luke chapter 10. And, and as always, if you're at one of our campuses and you don't have a Bible, then just take one of those with you. Uh, it's not stealing. We're giving you permission to take one because we want you to take it and read it. Now, if you're going to take it to the Swap Mart and sell it, please leave it where it is. But, uh, but you know, if, if you really want to learn from God's Word, we want you to have it. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then uh, message us, uh, either the service host or email us at our office at, at calvaryaz.com, and we'll be glad to get you a Bible, whether we mail it to you or whether we uh, bring it to your house and drop it off. We want everyone to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Uh, you may have noticed that I'm not alone up here uh, today, and so let me introduce my co-teacher. Uh, this is Amber Smith, and Amber is our uh, Director of Serve Ministry, Serve Coordinator, uh, so all those big community events that we do as a church, as a ministry, she's the one who's the brainchild behind them and uh, trying to organize and direct and, and all of that. She also, and you may not know this, but she holds a Master's of Divinity from Southern Seminary, so she's theologically trained as well. And for full disclosure, for those of you who are new, she's also my oldest daughter. So, uh, but, you know, I just want you guys to know that, so as we tell stories and stuff, you go, is there something similar there? They seem really close. We are. So... Hey, and, and I asked her to join w with me in teaching because the passage we're looking at this weekend uh, is about two women, and I am not a woman. You guys may have noticed that, uh, nor can I be. Uh, so uh, it, it's just one of those things I thought, hey, you know what, let's, let's invite uh, another perspective to join with me in opening up God's Word and challenging us because I, I want you to, to see what God is doing in the lives of these two ladies, Mary and Martha, or Martha and Mary, as they're headlined in the Scriptures. Now it says, as they went on their way, verse 38, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house, and she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. So as we begin this message, I just want you to understand that Jesus challenges our priorities. Jesus challenges our priorities. He challenged Martha's priorities in the story. Uh, he affirmed Mary's priorities in the story. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, it's personal, and you believe that He was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you've already kind of said, I want to do what Jesus wants me to do. I want to follow Jesus, so therefore I want to please Jesus with my life. You, you guys all get that, right? This is, this is about you saying, I want to please Jesus. So uh, today we want to begin by identifying the one thing that might get in your way of being the person that God called you to be, created you to be, and wants you to be as you're following Him. Now, uh, I will say this. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, we want you to listen in because we want to just make sure you understand that Jesus can change your life, He can save your life, He can forgive your sins, He can give you eternal life, but uh, it comes as you surrender to Him. So I want you to listen in to the expectations that uh, follow being a Jesus follower. So, first of all, what is distracting you from following Jesus? So I want to talk a little bit about the role of women in first century um, Israel. So um, women, everything that women did was in the home. Um, in public, men and women did not talk to each other. 
um, and women didn't go to school, and they didn't learn scripture, um, and that was because they didn't want it to distract them from the main job of taking care of their family and their home. So we see in this story right away, it's not normal for their culture. So a typical day for a woman would be to get up at sunrise, which sounds awful to me because I like sleeping in, um, and they would go and they would get water for their family. Um, they would carry it back in big jars, um, and then their day would start with cooking um, meals for their family, cleaning everything, taking care of their kids. They would have to grind barley to make bread every day. So their day was full of busyness and tasks in their home. And so we can see that Martha is just being a typical Jewish woman. And Mary is being abnormal for her culture, sitting and learning at Jesus' feet. But she's commended for that. Um, and so we see a lot of similarities between their culture for women um, and some similarities nowadays. Um, there's a lot of unrealistic expectations um, put on women, um, especially moms. Um, you have this idea of like you have to be this perfect mom with a perfect Pinterest house and cook homemade meals all the time, all while having a job. And it's pretty unrealistic. Um, and I know there's a lot of pressure and expectations on men as well, but I've never really heard like dad guilt before. Um, but there is this idea of mom guilt um, because there's these unrealistic expectations, these feelings of failures and feelings of being judged. And so how many moms out there, whether your kids are in the home or raised, ever felt like you failed and ever had that mom guilt? If, raise your hand. Okay. Um, I know I have um, as well. I've felt like a failure when I got angry and I yelled at my kids. Um, I felt like a failure when um, I don't keep my house perfectly clean all the time. Um, and it's definitely not spotless. Um, and those, I have thoughts of, you know, not measuring up, feeling like a failure, having thoughts of comparison, comparing my home to someone else's home. Um, and those thoughts are distracting. They distract me from what Jesus wants for my life. And those thoughts are also lies. They're lies from Satan. And the reason I know that is because it's not what God says about us. God says that we are chosen, we are loved, we are created with value and purpose, and we are made in the image of God. And so we need to remind ourselves the truth of what God says about us. Um, but sometimes um, we judge ourselves so harshly that we forget what Jesus says about us. Yeah, so let's talk about God's expectations for all of us, not just moms. Uh, the, uh, by the way, I never noticed your, your house not really being clean because I'm paying attention to your kids. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> just thought I'd say They're that. They're the ones that make it messy. But... Uh, <laughs> So what are God's expectations of us? I mean, because Scripture tells us, Jesus tells us, I mean, Jesus said, look, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So we know if we're going to please God, then we have to love. We have to love Him, <clears throat> and we have to love people who are made in His image. So loving is part of God's expectation for us, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, in, in Ephesians, the Apostle Paul said, for you, all of you, are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for you to do. So God declares that you are his artwork, his masterpiece. He thinks that of you. And, and, and in fact, he thinks so highly of you that he actually has a to-do list with your name on it. Hey, you ever think about that? You go, I, I'm, I'm not really important. That's not really true. God has things for you to do that he doesn't have for other people to do. And, and so you matter to God. He wants you to be who he created you to be, and he wants you to do what he created you to do. Not be like somebody else or try to imitate another person or to do what somebody else does. He wants you to do the things that he has for you. And, and see, I, I think that our unrealistic expectations sabotage us. Really, all of us at some level. Uh, whether there are expectations about perfection. We could ask uh, if there are any closet perfectionists in here. 
but uh, you can just go ahead and deal with that. You're like, I'm not perfect enough to be a perfectionist. Anyway, the, uh, <laughs> some of you have some unrealistic, unrealistic expectations about success and what it means to be a success or academics or athletics or, you know, all of these things. And see, our accomplishments can even be a distraction from us following Jesus. You, you, you heard the text. Martha was so busy serving that she missed out on Jesus. She was so focused on the tasks that she missed the Son of God, Savior of the world, that was in her living room. That, that's amazing. And, and, you know, I know that we would never get so busy that we would ignore Jesus, right? And then, I love this part of the story, she complained to Jesus about her lazy sister. Right? Jesus... Do you see Mary? She's just sitting there doing nothing and I'm having to do all the work myself. You, you never complained about your sister, did you? Never, okay. never, ever. All right. <laughs> and she's like, it's not fair, Jesus. Look, look at what she's doing. I'm doing all the work. Tell her to help me. And what does Jesus do? He does the complete unexpected because he doesn't rebuke Mary for not conforming to the norms of her day, he rebukes Martha for asking him to rebuke Mary. He says, you're the one who's wrong. She has recognized the thing that's important. Look, look at it again. Just listen to it. I mean, it's, it's so simple. But the Lord answered her, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen the good portion. So get this, Mar Martha prioritized working over a relationship with Jesus. She prioritized task over developing that deep relationship with Jesus. Jesus affirmed Mary. All right, so let's just do a little confession together. Uh, how many of you would say that you are more wired like Martha? How many Marthas do we have in the room? Okay, I see those hands. How many of you feel like you're more wired like Mary? Wait, like two-thirds of you didn't vote at all. <laughs> so uh, how many of you are sitting next to somebody who didn't vote or lied when they <laughs> voted? No. Uh, so <clears throat> see, here's the thing. Jesus calls us to a life of balance. Jesus calls us, every one of us, to a life of balance. In other words, it's both and, not either or. He doesn't want you to be Martha or Mary. He, he wants you to, to follow both of them and, and blend that together. Uh, he wants you to sit and serve. He wants you to learn and help. And, and, and here's why we need to let Jesus challenge our priorities because uh, we need to look at our lives because when life is out of balance, we fall down. I understand falling down a lot. Um, growing up, I was extremely clumsy and fell and embarrassed myself all the time. Um, but one story in particular uh, was in youth group. Uh, we met over at the McCulloch campus and we were playing a game and it was my turn to go on stage and I tried to walk up the three stairs going onto the stage and I tripped and I fell and I fell into the stool that was holding the game and it fell over, I fell over and the game fell over and broke. And so I embarrassed myself falling over, but I also ruined the game for everyone else um, because I broke it because I fell down. Well, I would like to say that you get that klutziness <laughs> from your mother, but you really don't. Uh, <laughs> you know, I shared a few weeks ago how on sabbatical, you know, I was praying and, and I, I fell down steps, slid down steps, uh, and uh, about eight or nine of them, and it hurt a lot. And, and, and that was like two days before I was turning 60. And one of my goals getting old is to not fall down. I already blew that. So uh, now my goal is to not fall down okay. again. Uh, and, uh, and I would say that I would get rid of my ladders, but then I would just be standing on chairs and that's even more dangerous. So uh, see, balance means that we build a deep relationship with Jesus and we serve Jesus. Okay, it's both. We need to be pursuing that relationship. We need to make room for Jesus in our lives, and we need to be serving our, our King. So I'll just tell you, I love sitting at the feet of Jesus. 
I, I love uh, learning about him. I, look, uh, I shared with you on my sabbatical when I fell down. I was away alone in a cabin praying. And, and I love to go and spend days, week, even a week, just alone with God. As an extrovert, it's a little challenging for me. But at the same time, I love just being in that environment and, and soaking it in. But I grew up in church. And growing up in church, I saw lots of people who were really good. Well, let's just say they were out of balance on the sitting side, right? They sat in pews or chairs. They sat in classrooms. They sat on their couch. They just pretty much did nothing. And it used to drive me crazy as a youth pastor. So I'm, I'm a young kid. I mean, I started being a youth pastor when I was like 19. And, and I'm going and I'm asking these adults that I thought were mature believers because they were always in church and they were always in Sunday school. And, and I would say, hey, can you help out with the, the students? Because we need help in the students. And they would say, well, I would help, but I can't leave my Sunday school class. The teacher is so good. And I won't tell you what, well, yeah, I will tell you what I thought back then. I didn't tell them what I thought back then because they were just being lazy. I'm like, you're, you're just soaking it all in. You're not giving any back out. Uh, now, on the flip side, churches are notorious at abusing Marthas. Maybe that's why some of you didn't raise your hand as Marthas. You're like, are they going to ask me to do something now? <laughs> I mean, look, if you're the Martha types, uh, churches love you and will work you to death. Right? A anyone ever been burned out uh, as a volunteer uh, helping out? Okay, see? Thank you for that confession. I I've almost burned out myself in ministry. But, but here's the thing. That's not our desire here at Calvary. We want you to have balance. Yes, we want you to grow and learn in your faith, but we also want you to serve in that, but we don't want you to burn out. We want everyone to serve and no one to get exhausted doing that. So uh, here's the thing. If you're, if you're a volunteer and you need a break and you're thinking, I'll just quit and go to another church, please don't do that. Talk to your ministry leader and just tell them, hey, I need a break. And they will bless you in that. If not, come tell me. Uh, but they will bless you in that. Because they want you for the long haul. They want you to be a servant long term. And so if you need some time off to rest, to recover, if it's a difficult time, if you've been going too hard, then uh, just ask for it so that you can heal because we really do want you serving long term. Um, I know from personal experience uh, what it looks like to have a life out of balance. Um, a couple years ago, I let my life get way out of balance, and I crashed really hard because of it. Um, my daughter, Emily, was a baby at the time and didn't sleep, like had never slept a night in her life. Um, she'll be four next month, and she still doesn't sleep. So if there are any parents out there who have children that don't sleep, I understand you. Um, maybe we could like get together and have a support group. Or and take a nap. Take, yeah, take a nap. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I was completely sleep deprived. Um, and it was the first time um, planning Night to Shine. Um, how many of you guys know what Night to Shine is? Okay, some of you do. Um, and so for those of you who don't know what Night to Shine is, it's a prom for people with special needs. Um, and it's an amazing event, and I was so excited to be able to plan it, but it's a lot of work. It takes several months um, in advance to plan, um, and we've had about 120 participants come, plus parents of those participants, and there's somewhere between three and 400 volunteers to make this happen. So if any of you guys volunteered in the past for that, thank you guys so much, because uh, we couldn't do it without you. Um, but I was so stressed out because I was not asking for help in the planning process, and I was not delegating, and I was not trusting and depending on Jesus. Um, and so after the event, I uh, bur like burned out physically. Um, my adrenal glands st stopped working, and I couldn't function to take care of my family or do anything really. Um, and it was a very long, slow process to heal physically. Um, and I still have side effects of that. Um, and that was several years ago. Um, but there was also a spiritual and uh, emotional and mental process of healing as well. And God taught me a lot through that process. He taught me that I need to slow down. 
um, and that I need to surrender everything to him, and I need to sit in his presence daily um, and read the Bible and worship him and trust him completely. Um, and when I do that consistently, um, I am way less stressed. I am a much better wife and a better mom. I can do my job better, um, and I can serve people well. Um, see, I'm naturally a Martha, and I just want to go and do stuff all the time. Um, but what I've learned is that I need Jesus more than anything, and I need to spend time with him daily, um, because when life is out of balance, we fall. Yeah. Um, see, Jesus is the one thing. Amber mentioned she needs to be in his presence, and it's true for all of us. And, and again, you've heard this twice already. I'm going to read it again. Jesus answered her, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen a good portion. That's not going to be taken away from her. See, Jesus wants to be the priority in your life. Okay, he wants to, to be the center of your life. Not a piece of your life. He wants to be at the heart of everything that you do, every decision that you make, every relationship that you have. Uh, so let me ask you this question, and, and I don't want the church answer. I don't want you to blurt it out because we all know what the correct answer is. Uh, but you and God probably need to wrestle with this all this week. Does your life revolve around Jesus, or is Jesus a part of your life? Yeah, and have you given Jesus authority over your priorities? Are you submitting your plans to Jesus or just asking Jesus to bless your plans? Are you willing to say to God, this is what I want, but I'm okay if you change it. Change my desires to be more like yours, God, um, and ask him to make you be content and grateful when he changes your plans because his plans are far greater than anything that we have planned for ourselves. So if Jesus is your Lord, can he reorder your life? Mm. So what does it look like to put Jesus first or to have your life, you know, revolve around him? Because I know some of you are thinking, does that mean that you, you know, does God really expect me to love him uh, more than my spouse, my kids, my grandkids? Uh, and the answer is yes. Yeah. See, loving God more than your spouse will help you to be a better husband or wife. Loving God more than your grandkids will help you to be a better grandma or grandpa. I mean, that's just the reality. Uh, see, I've been married to Morella for 38 years, uh, and uh, yeah, that is worth celebrating. And early in our marriage, I thought I was being really romantic one time, and I told her, I said, uh, honey, I can't live without Jesus, and I don't want to live without you. Uh, it was good theology, but I discovered then that theology and romance didn't really work, uh, not together. So uh, you may not want to try that because she wasn't really thrilled at the time that uh, she was in second place. Uh, she gets it now and she celebrates that now because now she knows if I'm with God, uh, if I'm building my relationship with Jesus, I am a much better husband and father than on my own. Okay, she gets that. If I love Jesus, then Jesus helps me to love better. Okay, this, this is how this works. This is why God's way is better, okay? And we just sang it a, a few minutes ago. But Jesus helps us love better. So, uh, you know, I'm less selfish if I'm hanging out with Jesus. I'm much more of a servant if I'm hanging out with Jesus at, at home. And that makes me a much better husband and father. Uh, here, just go to this point. 1 Corinthians 13, right? We quote this all the time. Love is patient, patient and love is kind. Do you want that kind of spouse in your house, patient and kind? Do you want that kind of parent in your house? I mean, think about this. So, uh, you know, put Jesus first. Yeah, we also need to put Jesus first above our family relationships. Um, see, I can't be a godly wife or mom um, if Jesus isn't my main priority and I don't spend time with Jesus. See, I don't want to be this great mom I want to be a godly mom um, who reflects Christ's character to my family. Um, and the only way I can do that is to have Jesus as the priority in my life. So how many of you guys have ever had those days where everything is just tense and you feel stressed about everything and everything annoys you, like people breathing just irritates you? 
Um, and then you like snap and yell at someone because someone asked you for like the 15th snack of the day. Um, and, and it's you, 10 a.m. Yeah, <laughs> and, or you cut their banana wrong. Um, <laughs> and you just wanna go hide in your room and lock it and just, you realize why, why am I so overwhelmed? And then you think, oh, it's maybe because I haven't spent time with Jesus lately. Um, I actually had this happen to me um, a couple of weeks ago. I was just annoyed at everything. And so before I like snapped and yelled at my kids, I literally went in my room and locked the door. Um, and the first thing I did was to like grab my phone and just scroll on it. Um, and thankfully like the Holy Spirit got my attention pretty quickly because I was thinking, what am I doing? Like going on my phone as a distraction uh, is not gonna help my attitude or help me at all. So I spent uh, just a few minutes reading some Psalms and praying and before my kids like started banging on the door. Um, but it was just enough time spending with Jesus that it helped um, me be able to show um, Jesus' love and his patience towards my kids and be able to reflect his character to them. Um, even in that midst of being overwhelmed. And I did something really risky um, getting ready for this. I asked my six-year-old son who he thought I loved the most. So it's pretty risky asking your kids this. Um, and so I was kind of like waiting to see what he answered and he said that I loved God the most. Um, and he said he was gonna say daddy, but then realized God was more important. Um, and I was so grateful for his answer in the fact that even though I mess up every single day because um, I'm a sinner who needs Jesus, um, that up to this point in his life, like I've been able to show him that Jesus is the most important thing in my life. Um, and if that's going to continue, that means that I have to continue to daily spend time with Jesus and to know him and love him better so that I can reflect him back to my family. Amen. Amen. Hey, so we want to close by getting really practical. We want to offer a uh, priority assessment. Uh, what we want to do is examine these areas in your life and invite the Holy Spirit to just kind of open your eyes and challenge your priorities. Uh, we're going to look at four areas of life. And, and what we're going to ask you to do is look at your life in the light of God and His Word and kind of say, am I giving Jesus authority over my priorities. Uh, the first one is time given to God. And this is sitting at Jesus' feet. This is time spent in prayer, Bible reading, Bible study, worship. Uh, it might be going to your life group. It might be listening to worship music in the car. But you can't build any relationship that's going to be healthy without time. We all know that. Remember when you were young and in love and you just wanted to spend every waking moment with that person and you wanted to know every thought they have, now their thoughts annoy you, uh, or you just ignore them. <laughs> but you wanted to know them and, and that's what it is with God. We wanna know Christ. So does your time, does your calendar indicate that Jesus is the priority in your schedule? The second assessment is leading your family to Jesus. Um, and this doesn't have to be strict or rigid. This should just flow um, as a natural part of your family in everything that you do. So do you prioritize coming to church and worshiping together? Um, do you pray with your family and not just when you eat? Um, and I know I've heard a lot like, I don't really know how to pray. If that's the case, that's okay. One, ask someone. Um, and then be honest with your family and say, hey, I don't really know how this prayer thing works, but we're gonna learn together and we're gonna grow and do it together. Um, do you talk to your family about God? Do you talk about the Bible and what God did through history? But do you also talk about your personal relationship with God and your struggles and how God helps you? Do you reflect God's character to your family? And when you fail, because we're sinners and we're going to, do you apologize? Um, one of the hardest things to do is to ask for forgiveness from your kids. Um, but when you do, it's very humbling and it's very powerful because it teaches your kids about God's grace and what that looks like in real life. 
Um, so did, uh, did I apologize to you when you were a kid? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Pass that test. Hey, uh, let me just rant for a minute. Parents, can I just encourage you to encourage your kids, your students, uh, to participate in life-changing opportunities? Uh, you know, we're talking about camps, retreats, mission trips. Uh, those are kind of those big moments where uh, they have an opportunity to meet God in a life-changing way, in a powerful way. Uh, and can I just encourage you to do that? In fact, we've got a high school camp coming up in about a week and a half, and we'd love for your students to go, and don't let the cost get in the way because we can help with that. But if you've got a high school student, you may want to talk to them and say, hey, why don't you go in this, check it out. And, uh, and here's my challenge. Uh, parents, send your kids on mission trips. Take your kids on mission trips. Grandparents, pay for your grandkids to go to camp. Pay for them to go on mission trips. Yeah, some of you are like, well, I wish I'd sent my kids to you know, church camp and youth camp and stuff. But uh, if you didn't, offer to pay now if you can. Remove the obstacles. Remove the things that get in the way. And, and if you can, if you're healthy enough, grandparents, take your grandkids on a mission trip with us. You know, now that you know, hopefully COVID's over, we can start traveling again and the countries will open up and we can go and visit. But, uh, but make that possible for them because it's a life changing opportunity. Yeah, going on mission trips um, really had one of like the greatest impact on my life growing up and changed me in so many beneficial ways. Um, I went to Disneyland and other amusement parks and other fun trips, um, but looking back, like I would always choose going on a mission trip over any of those other like fun uh, trips. And those are my greatest memories I have growing up are going on mission trips. Um, with my family and being able to serve together, which ties into the third assessment point, which is giving God our abilities. Um, see, we were created to serve. God has gifted each and every single one of us uh, with unique gifts and talents and skills, um, and he has given you those so that you can serve him uh, and serve those around you. Um, and, and wanting to serve comes out of spending time with Jesus. When you spend time with him and know him better, um, then you want to serve him out of gratitude. Um, but if you want to know more about serving, then you can sign up for our serve class, which is August 28th, um, and we go more in depth about how God has created you to serve. I did tell you she was a serve director, right? <laughs> uh, so. Hey, the final assessment of your priorities is how we use our money. How we use our money. Nothing reveals our priorities like how we spend money. Okay, if you want to see what someone's priorities are, we want to see what yours are, look at your bank statement. Look at your bank, you know, where you put the money tells everything. Now, the average American evangelical Christian, in other words, that's somebody who shares the same beliefs that you do. Uh, this, this, it didn't surprise me, but the average American evangelical Christian gives between $900 and $1,900 a year to church, to their ministry that they're involved in, which is between 2.5 and 3.2% of their income, depending on which survey you look at. Uh, and, oh wait, does anyone know what the Bible teaches about the percentage you're supposed to give? Yeah, tithing, 10%. Now, here's, the, here's what their statistics also revealed. 13% of, again, American evangelical Christians tithe. 19% give nothing. Now, I happen to believe that Calvary is way above average in those numbers, but that's as a church. How about you? So time spent with God, leading your family to Jesus, giving God your abilities, how you use your money. Have you given Jesus authority over your priorities? See, we want you to because we know that if life is out of balance, you'll fall down. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for making us your priority. You could have left us in our rebellion, in our disobedience, in our defiance, but instead you loved us and you pursued us all the way from heaven sending Jesus to be our Savior, to redeem us from hell, to give us life, even to adopt us as children of God. We don't deserve any of that, but we praise you for all of it. And as we pause to remember you, to celebrate you, to say thank you for what you have done for us, God, we surrender our priorities because you're the God who has the best plans for us if we'll just listen 
and obey. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.